Okay, uh, welcome everyone. On behalf of the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation, the WWROF, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Just recently, WWROF agreed to sponsor this webinar program for another year. It's a great way for us to bring topics uh, such as today's and other subject matters uh, to the contest and amateur radio community from the comfort of your home shack. I would encourage you to go uh, check out the webpage at www.wwrof.org, and as you can see, Randy's got a slide up there that uh, shows you um, some of the uh, things that the uh, organization's involved in. Take a minute to look at their uh, charter, the work they're doing, and if uh, you like what you see, consider uh, supporting them, and you can do that by clicking on the How Can I Get Involved link. Uh, you'll see a long list of supporters from uh, around the world, and they certainly would uh, welcome yours as well. Okay, uh, I want to mention that we uh, will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You're welcome at any point to uh, go ahead and submit a question. If you do so, uh, please put your call sign at the end of it so uh, we know who you are. And then, uh, like I said, we'll uh, pick those up and uh, Randy can answer them uh, at the end. I would mention uh, that you know sometimes we get a lot of questions and due to... Um, time constraints and everything, well, we're not able to get to all of them. So if we don't get to your question, we're not trying to duck anything. Um, and uh, we're not, uh, you know, we don't want you to feel bad. You can always contact Randy later on. I'm sure he'd uh, be happy to take care of it for you. Uh, our guest today is the CQ Worldwide DX Contest Director, Randy Thompson, K5ZD. Randy's been licensed since 1973 at the age of 13. And rather than me trying to list his operating achievements, let me just say that he is one of the most successful single operator uh, contesters in the United States. And I should know I've been chasing him for years and I haven't had a lot of luck. So. <laughs> uh, Randy's participated in uh, five uh, WRTC events, which I think is all of them. And apparently he liked it so much he's the uh, co-chair of the uh, WRTC 2014 in the uh, Boston area. And I believe that event is uh, just a little over nine months away. <clears throat> I want to mention we're trying something new today. Uh, you should be able to see uh, Randy on his webcam. Um, this is the first time we've used this. I think, uh, well, we're not sure if you can, you can try to move that window around if you want or uh, resize it, the uh, webcam and the uh, presentation, but uh, feel free, free to play around with that as it go along and uh, let, us, uh, let us know uh, how it works out for you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Randy, and uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. All right, thanks, Ken, and hello, everyone. Uh, for the video, if you do put that on the screen, probably the upper right-hand corner will be the place that uh, keeps it out of the way for uh, the presentation. So today I would like to talk about the CQ Worldwide DX Contest, a topic very close to my heart. I spend a lot of time thinking about it every day. And uh, we're going to divide the presentation really in, into two parts. Uh, I called it New Tools and New Rules. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some things that we've added to the CQ Worldwide website, and then also talk about the rule changes that happened, which is really the main emphasis of this presentation. I've had a lot of help in my first year. I've been on the job now for just a little bit, a little bit over 12 months, and we have quite a group of committee members from around the world who are help with advice and log checking and and gathering feedback uh, from all of you and uh, just help manage the contest and keep things running. So it includes the people that you see here plus the um, directors of the other uh, CQ contests. The CQ Worldwide keeps growing. Last year was another record year for us in terms of, uh, of log submissions. We had, uh, we had over um, 8,000 logs on sideband and over 7,000 on CW, which is really fantastic. And uh, that was up quite a bit from the year before. So you can see it's quite a growth curve here. I, I said last year on the webinar that my job as the new director was not to mess anything up. So we made it through year number one, and uh, we'll, we'll keep trying to continue that curve. But it's all about getting people on the air, having fun, and the logs just give us a way to uh, keep track of the activity. This is a, a map that uh, ZL2HAM uh, put together. And what he did was took all of the entries for CQ Worldwide Phone 2012 last year and plotted them on a map based on the location of the call sign as best as, we could, as he could determine it. 
And where you see a very large circle, that means there were a number of entries from that same area. And where you see a small circle, it means there were less entries. What I love about this map is how it shows the activity. And one of the reasons why the CQ Worldwide is such a fabulous uh, contest is not only do we have great activity in the northeastern United States and all through Europe, but notice how there are little purple dots everywhere. South America, in Africa, out in the Pacific, and all the different islands, all through Asia. This wide variety of activity from around the world is really what makes the contest uh, so exciting and so special. And we see the same thing on CW. Uh, very similar demographics, a lot of activity in the Northeast and part of the United States, big activity in Europe, and then um, purple dots uh, all around the world. Maybe not quite as many, uh, but uh, certainly more in uh, Russia and so on. So one of the things that was a big change for last year, um, CQ Worldwide in 2012 was the first year that CQ, and this was CQ Magazine who made this decision, um, they changed the log deadline to five days after the contest. And uh, this moved it from three weeks or four weeks down to just five days. And there were a number of reasons for this, but the biggest one was people wanted faster results. And to be able to get the results out faster, we needed to get the logs in quicker so the log checking period, you know, so we could still get our job done. So not only did we cut log checking from three weeks to, to five days, we cut the log, I mean the log deadline, we cut the log checking period from 180 days to 90 days. So we cut that in half. Anyway, the result of this is, uh, the logs need to get in pretty quickly, and so for the contest this year, that means you got to get it in by November 1 for the phone contest and November 29 for uh, CW. So pretty much when the contest is over, send your log in right away. We recognize that there are people, for, what, for a variety of different reasons, who are unable to get their log in in that time period. You may always request an extension. You must request the extension before the deadline. So if you're going to ask for an extension, do it before the, the log deadline shown here. And uh, when you ask for the extension, please give us the reason why you need more time and then the date that your log will, will be received by us or that you'll be submitted so that we know um, when to expect it. And if, the, if it's a valid reason, uh, you have a very good chance of getting the uh, extension. But uh, this is just a... It's just a necessary part of the process. We need the logs in so we can get our job done and, and produce the results. Now, one exciting thing about this year, the CW contest, is November 23rd and 24th. It is not the same weekend as the USA Thanksgiving holiday. So most years, I think six out of seven years, the contest and the this giant holiday are on the same weekend. Sometimes that's good because it meet, allows more people to participate, but the Thanksgiving holiday is a very big family holiday, very big travel day in the United States, so uh, it's nice to have the contest not on the same weekend so that uh, people will be able to participate and then have the Thanksgiving holiday the following weekend. Uh, so I expect in some ways we'll see more activity from the United States, um, but it, it'll be interesting to see if this impacts the number of expeditions that we have. So if you're used to always doing Thanksgiving and eating turkey and then having the contest, uh, this year it's not, it's not on that schedule, so be aware of that. So let's talk about some of the new tools that we've been working on over the last 12 months. Uh, CQ Worldwide does have its own Facebook page, and uh, generally when there's some news, whether we post a new blog entry or we update something on the website, um, We've been posting that information on Facebook. The Facebook postings also flow through to Twitter, so we have a Twitter account. But if you're just interested in kind of following along with what's going on or when something new happens, um, this is probably the best place to, uh, to subscribe. So just follow us here on Facebook, and when something new happens, you'll see the, the message go by. The real uh, main focus has been on the cqww.com website. So the website is where we want to put all the information that you need to, to get prepared and to um, submit your log. So we have the rules in multiple languages. There's a frequently asked questions about the rules, so there's some explanations. 
We have an online score database. You can see a PDF file of all the results articles for all time. So it's kind of fun to just pick a year, go back to say 1964 and open up the uh, worldwide phone results and you'll see that um, you know things were different back then and that the radios were bigger and the scores were smaller because there wasn't as much activity. But you'll also see many of the same themes um, going on about log checking and scoring and uh, people not following the rules and so on. So <laughs> it's interesting to look back in time and see that the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So one of the focal points of the CQ uh, website, in addition to the rules, is this database. So uh, John, N2NC, has been working with a team of people to go back in time, and we're taking all of the contest write-ups, or all the score listings from all the years, and we are putting them in, or typing them in, and putting them into a database so that now on the website you can actually come in and search um, for uh, information about the efforts that you've done. And we really have to say thank you to the, the people listed here because they've been doing the very hard job of typing in all of these scores. <laughs> uh, it's just, it, it's not a glamorous job, uh, but it's, it's necessary. And then once they get them all typed in, John takes them and gets them ready, and then uh, we put them into the database. So just to give you an idea of what the uh, database is all about, if you go to the, to the results page, score database, you'll see you can look at the CW or you can look at, at sideband. Um, and you can look at any one particular year. So you could pick a year and say, I'm interested in 1997. Or you could just type your call. So I'm going to type in Ken's call here just to see what. So when you type in a call sign, we look into the database and we find every place K4ZW appears as either the call used in the contest or in the operator list. So this is kind of cool because you can go back and see the contest that you participated in in the past. I know for me that they, they all are kind of running together so it's nice to be able to uh, look back and see what uh, happened in the past. Um, we can, if we pick the year here and drill in now it takes us in and says, okay, show us 2012 for the category that K4ZW is in, and now we would be able to look down and find a score. Okay, and you're, way, you're too far down here. So we can see K4ZW was number 23 in the world. Well, that's interesting, but how was he in the United States? So if we select United States from the country dropdown, we're filtering the results by... Um, by country, and now we can see that looks a little better. K4ZW is number three in the country. Now, one of the things that uh, everybody enjoys in the CQ Worldwide write-up is seeing the band breakdowns uh, that show up in the results, but they generally only do the, the um, top uh, six entries in the major categories. You don't get to see the band breakdowns in some of the other categories, or in low power, for example. So just by checking the show breakdowns box, now you can see the, the band breakdowns for every entry regardless of what uh, category it is. So if we want to look at single operator low power in the United States, now we can see uh, who's been winning in, in, in that category. And we can see N1UR and N5AW, two guys that always seem to be up there. Now you'll notice off to the right here, there's a certificate field. So if you select certificate, if you click on that certificate link, it brings up a page and gives you a choice of making a PDF file of your certificate, and you can look at this in uh, different formats. So I clicked on the one for N1UR here. It takes a moment or two to open up, um, and we'll be able to see uh, as soon as Adobe Acrobat does its job here. What usually happens is as soon as I quit waiting for it, it will come up. So anyway, it'll come back in a minute or two. So while we're so while we have all this database information, and you can look at things by zone or by country and so on. Um, another use here, there's N1UR certificate. So we can see that N1UR here in the contest, he was number one. Here was the score, and then we also can show that this was an all-time record 
uh, for the USA uh, W1 call area. So kind of cool, something to uh, chase. And uh, what's really great is, you know, the guys who win, they always get the paper certificates. But if you're down here in 35th place or something like that, you can still make a certificate and, uh, and put it on your wall. All right, so um, I was going to talk about records. So if, um, you know, another thing we can do out of the database is we can automatically calculate the all-time record. So what we're looking at here is the world records. So I've gone to records, all categories, selected world, which is the default, and now we can see who, who the winners have been. And if we um, are curious about, well, who else has been competing in multi-single with P33W, if I click on that, here's a list of all the all-time high scores in multi-single for um, you know all, all the years that we have in the database. So we can see P33W and D4 have been uh, very good places to be. If I come back and uh, let's say we want to look at the all-time records in um, where would be a good place? Uh, we'll pick a place Ken's been to. We'll pick Mongolia. So if we look at the all-time records in Mongolia, now we can see that okay, uh, there's been, you know there's not been an entry in multi two on CW from Mongolia. Here are the top scores. You know, even back to 1990, JT1F has the top uh, 20 meter single band score from from that country and so on. And there's been no entries in QRP uh, assisted because that category has only been in the last couple of years. So it's not unusual to see down here in the new categories. It takes a while. But I hope that it, it gives you an idea of, um, of just how you can, as you're preparing for the contest, you can come in and look for a category to, uh, to chase or look and see what other people have done over the years and, and uh, help plan your strategy. Just for fun. Uh, well, we also have the ability to do zone records, so you can look and see. Well, who is the uh, who are the score records for Zone 13? Let's say you're planning an expedition there. Now you can get a, a very quick idea of who what the what it takes to set a zone record in Zone 13. Another thing that's kind of fun is if we go back here. There's a, a box uh, a menu entry called Winners, and what this shows is for any country and category, here's a list of the top score every year for the period of the database. So we can see that for single op, single op all band world, here are the, the winners over time and kind of how the scores have gone. You can see a little bit of impact from the solar cycle there. Uh, but we could also go look at, um, you know, single op assisted uh, 20 meters. And if we do that, same thing. We can see who who is the top single op assisted 20 meter score for each year. And uh, although I don't know how this G3B got in here, I'm gonna have to look into that one and find out what happened. Okay, so uh, let's see. I think that was the main things that I wanted to cover there. But uh, a lot of it, this database is really fun to go back and look and see kind of what you've done over time. So we talked already about the score records and how you select things by country. Uh, we've looked at the winning score history, so you can look back in time and see who's been winning your, your call area or your country over the years. Now I wanted to talk about another tool called the, well, so to finish up on the database, we are going to continue adding to the database. We hope to go all the way back to the beginning before it's all over, um, but it may take us a while. And uh, one thing that we do ask is that everyone go and search for their call in the database and make sure that we have everything typed in correctly because we are typing things by hand so it's quite possible that we missed a digit or we added a digit to a score or something like that so uh, you can help us uh, improve the quality of the database by giving us some feedback. So one of the other things that people often uh, get frustrated with after the contest is when they're submitting their log uh, because uh, you would submit it by email to the robot and the robot would send you a response and maybe you would get it, maybe you wouldn't. Uh, there were just a lot of places that things could fail. So with the help of LZ2FQ, uh, we constructed a page where you can come into logs, log check, you can select the contest, you can paste your log in or upload it by choosing a file. We will look through your log and check that the formatting and all the fields that we need are correct. And um, 
we will tell you if any of them are not right, if something's not spelled correctly or we're missing information that we need. And you can fix it right here in the, um, in the dialog and then hit process again. And when it's complete, you'll see that it will offer you a chance to enter your email address and say send log to robot. And we will submit it for you. So in one place, very quickly, you can paste your login and uh, send it off to the robot. And so just to show kind of how that process will work, I'm going to go to logs, log check. I'm going to select Cyban 2013 this year, so the contest that's coming up. And uh, let me go find my log here. I've got one called AA1ZZZ. And when I process this log, it comes in and tells me, oh, there's two problems here. Number one, the category power is wrong. I've got five watts written here, and the valid values it tells me are high, low, and QRP. So I can just come in, repair this. And then it also tells me the location is wrong. Well, USA entries, USA and Canada entries or call signs need to have a location, which tells us what state they're in. And the reason for that is we need to know whether they're operating in their call area shown by their call or whether they're operating somewhere else. So uh, in this case, AA1ZZZ is in Massachusetts, so we type that in correctly. It can be, it can be the state name or the section name. And this time when I process it, it tells me everything is okay. And so I can put in my email address. If I check the box, it will, it will not only send my log to the robot, it will also send a copy of my log back to me. So this way you end up with a copy of what you actually submitted. And when I say send, it's done. And uh, usually within about two minutes or so, you'll get, uh, you'll get the confirmation email back from the robot. So you still, we're still sending the log to the robot, and you still want to see that um, confirmation come back to know that your log uh, got fully submitted. Now, when your log is submitted, you can go to the logs received page. So logs received SSB. And here, after the contest, you'll see as the logs start coming in, they will all show up here. So if you do not see your call sign or your log here in this logs received list, we don't have it. So you should immediately contact questions at cqww.com and help us figure it out. Uh, very important. This is the last step in the process. If you see your, um, your log show up in the logs received, then you know that we have it and you're ready to go. Okay, so those are just some of the things in the CQWW website, and I hope that um, you take a few minutes to, uh, to visit there just uh, while I'm at it. One other thing, there is a blog on the CQ Worldwide website. Um, if you are familiar with blogs, um, you might want to subscribe. Again, this is where we put things when we make announcements. So we announced the historical score database, um, had an editorial on cheating. We announced that the rules were available in 13 languages. And, and who did it, that kind of thing. So if you want to keep up with what's going on, Facebook is one way, but um, you can also just subscribe to the, uh, to the blog here. Okay, so back earlier in the year, in March, we took the 10,000 highest scoring entries from CQ Worldwide 2012, both modes together, and we mailed an invitation to all of those people asking them to take a survey. And we also announced this on the CQ Contest Reflector. Uh, so it was not a private survey. We were, anyone was welcome to participate, but we wanted to um, you know, really focus on getting the uh, feedback from the participants. And so during a, a three-week period in March, we had 4,800 responses to the survey which was really fantastic and uh, gave us a very good uh, insight into what people were thinking. And we asked a lot of different questions, and I'm just going to point to a few of them here. It's very interesting, just as you saw in the uh, map of 2012 with all the purple dots centered in Europe, we can see from our survey results that Europe really is the major center of activity in contesting today. Uh, we received the most um, responses from Europe. It was also interesting that, um, you know, since these are people who submitted their contest logs, we expect that they would be competitors. 
and uh, we can see here that uh, that indeed uh, the survey respondents were people who were either trying to win and trying to win with their own definition. It might have been trying to win their section, trying to win their continent. Uh, maybe people who are just part-time trying to have a good score, people who are chasing awards, and so on. But I'd say this is, you know, decent distribution of people. So we feel like, all right, we 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 heard from all types of participants. This was very interesting. One of the questions we asked was was your age, and what we see from our respondents is that the Europeans tend to uh, be a little bit younger. Uh, the Europeans are shown in green, and the USA um, responses um, tend to be a little bit older, by uh, about 10 years or so. Uh, so I'm not sure what this means, but it tells us that not only is Europe activity growing very uh, rapidly, but uh, tends to be a lot of younger people involved, which is really great. But for all of us, the real concern should be that we're not seeing enough new people at the, uh, at the low numbers here. So anything you can do to get uh, to encourage young people to get into ham radio or get into contesting uh, is, in, is important for our future. Now, since last year was the first year of the five-day log deadline, um, we wanted to ask people what they thought about it. And, um, you know, most people feel that it's okay. Um, there are some people who actually said make it shorter, which is interesting. Uh, and then uh, there is a, 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 a there is a group that that thinks that's not enough time. I think most of them, based on the comments, would like to see the following weekend. Uh, they'd like to see a seven day deadline instead of five. But um, right now we're staying with five, and part of the reason for that is we really want people to get their log in. We don't want them to spend a lot of time cleaning the log or working on it to make it more accurate. Just finish the contest and send the log in. That's what we want, so we think five days is, is sufficient for that. And as I said, you can always ask for an extension if there's a, a <coughs> an issue. One of the most controversial questions from the survey was about whether we should combine these single operator and single operator assisted categories. And, um, you know, there are most contests around the world have combined these. The, uh, it's the U.S. contest which have not. The ARL and the CQ contest still keep separate categories. And I think you can see a little bit of why in the survey responses. What we can see in Europe is that there's a mix, uh, maybe a slight majority in favor of combining them. Whereas in the USA, it was a very strong um, you know, uh, vote against um, combining the two categories. And maybe this has to do with the age, maybe it has to do with just tradition, something like that. But uh, the end result is we can see that there's just not enough, um, you know, reason to change at this point. And, uh, and as long as people are um, honest and following the rules, there's nothing wrong with having two categories. It's not a problem for the contest. We can still check the logs. It's really just, uh, you know, a question of whether we need the two categories or not. And right now it appears that people still want them. Another uh, question on the survey, um, after each contest, I get a lot of complaints from people about, you know, poor signal quality, whether it's splattering or clicks or something like that. And so the question was, should that be a reason to disqualify someone? Um, if someone is transmitting on 80 meters and they have a very strong signal on 40 meters, they're obviously using two bands. They're being a poor neighbor. Um, you know, is that something that that the contest community thinks uh, is okay, or should be, uh, uh, you know, something that can be penalized? And so, obviously, there's very wide support for um, doing something about this. So we have added a rule uh, to this, and we are working on some technical standards within the committee for how we will interpret this. But um, I think the most important thing here is operate within good amateur radio practices. You know, uh, don't run too much power, don't splatter, don't have big key clicks, and uh, and I don't think this will be an issue at all. And occasionally there'll be someone who doesn't obey all those things and will um, investigate them. So there were many more questions than that, but I thought those were some of the more interesting ones. If you want, if you go to the blog, 
there is a, a blog entry where we provide a PDF document that lists all of the comments and all the results for every question. So if you want to see what your fellow competitors are interested in or thinking about, um, you can read everything that they said uh, in, the, uh, in this results document. So once we had the results, we had some internal discussion within the committee. We had a public review period where we did two different uh, drafts of the rules, an original one and an intermediate one. So everyone in the world had their chance to comment on the, um, the rules as written, and we received some fantastic um, feedback. Which, and we did change some of the rules or some of the text based on the feedback. And then on July 1st, we um, released the new rules. So let's talk about some of the um, some of the rules here. So there's no change to the scoring. So everything that you know from the past is still true. Three points for a different continent, one point for same different country, same continent, except in North America where it's two points. Uh, and this is a historical thing from a long time ago. I'm not sure exactly what the origin was, but uh, it's just always been that way. Uh, mostly, this gives the station in the Caribbean. Uh, some extra points for working the USA. And then, of course, if you work your own country, uh, it's zero points. But you need to do that because those say, even though there's zero points, they do count for multipliers. The multipliers are the number of countries that you work per band, and this is the DXCC list plus the WAE um, list. So this means there's a couple of extra countries uh, like uh, IT9, uh, counts as a country. Kosovo, Zulu 6 counts as a country because they're on the WAE list. And then of course CQ zones uh, per band. So you add countries and zones together, multiply it times the total QSO points and that's your score. We have a lot of different entry categories so you can enter a single operator all bands or single band, single op assisted all band or single band. And you can operate in three different power categories, 1,500 watts, 100 watts, or 5 watts. We have two new overlay categories, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Then, of course, we have multi-op. Right now, in the CQ Worldwide CW and SSB contest, multi-op entries are all grouped together in the high power category, in 1,500 watts. Um, some of the other CQ contests have adopted a 100-watt multi-op category, and that's something that uh, we may consider for next year uh, if we get enough uh, feedback on that. So what are these overlay categories? The overlay categories are something new. They've been in the CQWPX contest for a number of years and now we're bringing them into the worldwide. An overlay category is like a second parallel contest. So you enter the CQ worldwide the same as you always have. And then if you add a line to your log, category overlay, you can also enter a second competition at the same time. And these two overlay categories that we're going to begin with, the first one is the rookie category. This category is available for anyone who has had an amateur radio license for less than three years. So if you were licensed 30 years ago and then you let your license go away and then you got licensed again, you're not eligible because you had a license more than three years ago. But if you received your very first amateur radio license in the last three years, then you can enter in the rookie category. And it's very fun to compete with other people who are the same skill and experience that you are. Um, what we saw in the WPX contest was that uh, rookies would uh, make a good effort in year number two, and then you could see them improve their skills and make a much stronger effort in, in year number three before they uh, moved out of the category. So we, we're, we like this category because it gives everyone a chance to see these new um, newly licensed TAMs as they uh, are coming into contesting and we can all look for them and, and reach out and help them. The other category is uh, the is called the classic and I'm going to talk about it more in detail here. The classic category has a couple of very specific rules, and these were done because of comments that we received from the survey. There were a lot of people who said, I can't operate the whole uh, 48 hours for whatever reason, job, family, work, I mean, uh, job, family, uh, health, whatever the reason. And um, we wanted a category where these people could compete, 
but we wanted to keep it simple uh, and keep the things. Uh, so that's why we said only one radio. So people entering the classic overlay uh, cannot be doing SO2R. This is for people who have one radio. They're getting on the air. And then uh, we wanted to make it um, easy for us to administer. And uh, also what we were noticing was a lot of the guys that were asking for less time, uh, they, wanted to, they wanted the more traditional um, operating, contest operating, like, they, uh, like it used to be. So we said no DX cluster, no assistance. So a single operator, one radio, and then limited to 24 hours of operating time. Now, it's not 24 hours in one stretch. You get to choose your own 24 hours, however you would like. So in the example over here on the right-hand side, we can see this operator operated for two hours, then took a break, then operated for four hours, and then took a break, and so on. And they operated their 24 hours, and then they kept operating some more. They actually operated two hours beyond, which is fine. We want you to operate as much as you want. But in the end, we're going to calculate your overlay score based on the first 24 hours of operation. And an off time is 60 minutes with no QSO. So any time that you don't make a contact for more than 60 minutes, that, will, that does not count uh, as operating time. So uh, you get to choose when you'll operate during the weekend. And if you get to the 24 hours and the bands are still good, uh, by all means, keep going. Because your traditional category score will be made up of everything that you do. Your overlay score will stop at 24 hours. So uh, it's so you actually have motivation to do the best you can in 24 hours, but the freedom and the flexibility to keep operating more if you want. One other thing I forgot to mention, in the overlay categories uh, for both rookie and classic, uh, we won't have single band. Uh, we're only going to have all band. So we're going to take your log. Um, whether it's an all-band log or a single-band log, and we're going to calculate the score as all bands. And this will um, is partly so we don't have to deal with so many categories and certificates, um, but also just to kind of get everybody to get, give us a way to test drive this category and then decide next year if we need to expand it some more. But let's say that you do single-band 20 meters and you submit your traditional log as single-band 20, but you also work some stations and you log them on 40 or 80 meters or 15 meters or something just because you wanted to have some fun and go work some other stations. That's fine. You will have a single band 20 meter score that will be your traditional score. And then if you entered the classic category, your classic score would be the total of all the bands put together. So there's actually some advantage perhaps if you do single band to work some stations on the other bands um, just to help with your classic score. But that's part of what's going to make it so interesting this year is that everyone will have a chance to choose their own strategy. And maybe your strategy is just to operate for fun and stop whenever you feel like it. And other people will try to figure out exactly what the best times are to, uh, to be on the air. But one radio, one operator, um, no assistance, that means you really have to be a good DXer to, uh, to find the right balance for a big score. We did remove three things for our, in 2013. We removed the team competition. The team competition was uh, uh, you could choose any 10 people and submit as a team. Um, we weren't seeing very much activity there, and we wanted to promote the club competition. The extreme category was a category almost without rules. The idea was you could do things uh, to encourage people to try new technologies. We still think that that's a good idea. Uh, just this category was not very well designed. So we're taking it out for this year, and we'll think about uh, bringing it back in a, in a new way uh, next year. And then uh, we also um, removed the concept of yellow and red cards and replaced it with just a single disqualification. So um, the yellow and red was just not – the picture, the, vi the image was very nice, but the, in practice it was very difficult to manage. So now if you are disqualified, you're just disqualified. There's no colors involved. One other change was in the club competition. We split it into two different um, competitions. So there's 
<coughs> excuse me, a USA club category. Uh, and this is because in the USA, the, there's a long tradition, uh, partly uh, driven by ARL club rules, of what a club is. The club is people within a circle, 175 miles. Um, it, so every, the idea was just everybody is in a local area. And then, of course, we allow the expeditions to also count for the club, just as they always have. But in the DX, um, outside the United States, it was much different. Uh, people, are, the, the contesters are much more uh, spread out. Uh, the countries are very big with maybe low activity. And so we decided that we would make a different rules for the outside of the U.S. clubs. So all of their entries now, there's no distance limit. Their rules can, their entries can come from people in the same country and within 275 kilometer circle around their club center. So as an example, the Bavarian Contest Club is located near Munich. I just picked Munich as an example. And so they can have their entry, the members of their club submit entries who are, their members can be anywhere in Germany. So even far up in North Germany can still be a member of the BCC. And then also we can, they can have members who are within this circle, within this distance of the club center. So maybe some from Austria or Czech or maybe uh, Luxembourg, Switzerland, that kind of thing. Um, but under these rules, there couldn't be anyone submitting a log from uh, Belgium or the Netherlands or something like that for the Bavarian Contest Club. And again, the whole idea of the club cat competition definition is just to provide some constraints so that we're comparing um, you know, somewhat similar things together. We do not want to make this a game of recruiting new members over the internet. There is a rule, um, again, asking you not to do any changes to your log after the contest um, by using databases or recordings or sending email confirmations. Uh, if you made some notes for yourself, that's fine. Uh, if you have something in your head, that's fine. But what we don't want is going and looking up information uh, to improve your log. That's against the rules. So when the contest is over, make sure that the Cabrillo file header information is correct. As you saw, we checked that in the log check uh, page. Make sure that your log has all the fields in it that it's supposed to have, and then send it in. If you made a typing mistake or you miscopied a call sign, it's okay. It's part of the game, and, uh, and, and you learn from that and go on to the next year. We did reduce the penalties for logging errors. So if you make a duplicate contact, or you miscopy the exchange, like you don't copy the zone number correctly, you lose that QSO, but doesn't, there's no extra penalty. So you really want to work as many duplicate, you want to go ahead and log the duplicate contacts if you make them. There's no penalty for doing that. There's also no penalty if a multi-op makes a band change error. Let's say they change bands too early, uh, something like that. We just remove the contacts that they weren't allowed to make. The biggest thing is, if you make a mistake in a call sign or you are not in the other log, so you think you worked a station but you are not in his log, that you lose the QSO and then you also lose two times the QSO point value of that contact. So why do we have an extra penalty for these? The biggest reason is we want people to make sure they get the call sign right when, and they make sure that they made a QSO. So the most important thing is if you didn't work the station, then that's, uh, we don't want you to put it in the log. We also don't want people to guess. So this is not a game of let's just write down five or six calls and hope we get the one that, hope we get one that's right. So you want to really take the time um, when you're operating to make sure that uh, you copied the call sign correctly and that the other station copied your call sign correctly. Now, a um, couple of things that you should know. Uh, when we're doing the log checking, the, lo the computer starts with your log and it goes one QSO at a time. And for each QSO, it looks in all the other logs that we have to find, or it looks in the other log to see if you're there. 
And if you're not, it will look in other logs to see if there's anything that might be close. Um, but we only do this within a 30-minute time window, which is still a very wide period of time. But we're saying that if 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 you make a QS, if you log a QSO at a particular time, we're only going to look plus and minus 30 minutes in the other log to find that QSO. If we don't find it, it will count as a not in log, and you will have the 2x penalty. So please, please check the time on your logging computer. You want to make sure the time that your logging stations is correct. Um, we often see logs where daylight savings time change occurred, and so the second half of the log will be off by one hour. And when we see that, we will try to fix it if we can, because uh, we don't want participants to lose points. But at the same time, uh, we want people to make sure that they're actually having a QSO at the time that they said. I mentioned before, we are exchanging, we are checking the zone information. So if you're working USA stations, um, you do want to pay attention to the zone number that they're sending and record it correctly in the log. So if you work K5ZD, you know, my call area, my the W5 says I should be in zone 4, but I'm actually in zone 5, and you just need to uh, pay attention to that because there are a lot of USA stations that are operating outside of their uh, what their call area of their call sign indicates. We do plan to have uh, software-defined radio um, listening sites around the world. Who we uh, we did this last year, and uh, we have it even. Uh, better process this year. So we will record all of the bands from different places around the world. And what this means is if there's a dispute or a question about a log or a QSO, we have the ability to go listen to that QSO uh, on the different recording sites that we have so we can see what happened. So this helps us find stations that maybe didn't change bands according to what their log says or transmitted more than one signal at the same time or this might be a tool that we use for analyzing um, poor quality signals. So we do have the ability to go back and hear actually what happened on the air, and it's, it's amazing what you can find. Of course, we hope everyone has a great score and, and certainly able to win a certificate for their call area or their country. Um, there are also plaques available, and uh, if you go to the website, there's a plaque page and we do still have some plaques that are available for sponsorship, and you would contact K1AR to uh, help with that. The 2012 plaques are in the process of shipping now. Um, uh, we're a little behind, but we're much more caught up than we have been, so um, by next year I think we'll, we'll have this process even better. Some other resources you should be aware of. Um, NG3K every year uh, compiles a list of all of the planned expeditions for CQ Worldwide Phone and CW. It actually does for every contest. But um, this is a great tool before the contest. Go see who all the different expeditions are and what call signs they'll be using and what category they'll be in. So that if you hear them on the air or if you hear part of their call, you know, oh, that's a rare station in Africa. I need to turn my beam or that's a station out in the Pacific, I need to go look for them, uh, that kind of thing. So very helpful to have that, uh, take a look at it or print it out before the contest. And then it's also very helpful to learn the CQ zones. <clears throat> the ones in Europe and so on are very easy because you work lots of stations there and you learn them after a while. But you know, have an idea where the zones are so that when you hear a station sending zone 37 or a station sending zone 23, you know which direction you need to to turn your antenna. So I guess in summary, I'll just um, ask everyone to visit the CQ Worldwide uh, website, read the rules. We have the rules in all those different languages, uh, so you can read, uh, hopefully get a good understanding. If you have questions about the rules, you're always welcome to send them to questions at cqww.com, and we'll come back to you with the answer. Once you've read the rules, get on the air in the contest. Work lots of DX, have fun, because in the end, it, that's what it's all about. It really is about having fun. And then uh, submit your log, because that helps us, uh, helps us with the log checking. You might win a certificate, and uh, it just provides a record of what you did 
and it's always great, as you saw with the historical database now, it's fun to look back in time and see what you did each year, but you can only do that if you send in a log. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ken to see if we have any um, any questions. I know I went pretty fast through all of that, but we can certainly go back and talk about things if we need to. Okay, Randy, very good. Uh, thank you much. So we've got a few questions here for those of you uh, that want to uh, go ahead and put your question in the question box, put your call behind it, and uh, go ahead and send it in to us. We have a little bit of time here, so we'll try to grab some of these. The first question comes from Glenn K2FF and just wants to confirm that these changes do not include the CQ Worldwide RTTY contest. Is that correct? That's correct. That, the Worldwide Ready contest was last weekend. Now, um, the Ready contest did adopt many of the same language and the same text as the worldwide, we're trying. Um, W0YK and I are trying to keep things as synchronized as we can. But the Ready contest has some um, very different rules around multipliers and so on. And right now, there's no plans to change it. Okay, um, you were talking before about uh, dirty signals and that sort of thing. Uh, PWRM asks about uh, aggressive uh, operating practices, aggressive calling, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, is that something that could be penalized as well? Uh, <laughs> that's a difficult one because uh, everyone has a little bit different opinion or opinion of what is correct. And also, in the heat of the contest, of course, we all know that with fatigue and everything that you have know, many different operating styles. So I would say right now that is not an area that we are set up to, to pursue or would want to make any rules about. Obviously we want people to be good neighbors and to be and use good operating practices, uh, but we're going to rely on peer pressure to encourage that. Okay, a uh, number of questions on the uh, classic overlay, so let's go ahead and hit these. Uh, first one from Jeff, uh, wondering in the uh, classic overlay, uh, since it's uh, just single uh, single radio, is SO2V okay? Um, yes, there's nothing that prohibits that. The only thing that we are saying is that you cannot listen at the same time you're transmitting. I realize in most radios that's not a problem, but... Uh, we really are trying to keep things classic, as the name implies. So, uh, so yes, you can listen around on the second VFO, but uh, you, you can't use one of the new SDR radios that can listen and transmit at the same time. Okay, uh, next one again on the uh, classic category from Dave Kilo, November 7, Sugar. Um, can I select which of the 24 hours I want to have scored, or is it just the first 24 hours? Yeah, this I wish we could give you a way to select, but right now we're doing it. We're um, to provide a little bit of uh, strategic decision making. We're basing it on what's in your log. So we start on the first QSO that starts the timer, and um, we stop the timer if you go 60 minutes without a contact. And when you hit 24 hours, you're done. So uh, you have to decide a little bit whether you want to pick pick the best hours and focus on that or whether you just want to allow the clock to run out when it runs out. Because I guess otherwise someone could operate full 48 hours and then cherry pick the best 24 and right, I'm not sure right. that's and what that's, you have in mind. We did Well, <laughs> we just didn't want to get into having to figure out how to score all of that. Well, that too, yeah, it creates a lot of uh, administrative work for you. So, Okay, yeah, another uh, classic question from Louise. Uh, is it uh, multi or a single band um, that can be used? Well, you can do either one, but we're going to score all of the classic overlay logs as though they are all bands. So if you only enter one band, that's fine. You're just going to have a lower score than the guys who work all bands. Okay, next one from uh, George K5KG. Let me see if I understand this right. Since the uh, classic overlay is non-assisted, will the classic overlay be counted if I work uh, single op assisted for the full contest? I'm well, wondering. if you're single op assisted, you're not allowed to enter the classic overlay. Right. So maybe you know, if you do your first 24 hours and then you want to go assisted after that, you're you're probably okay, right? Uh, no, because the way we're going to do things is as soon as we see your log says assisted, you are not in the classic category. Oh, anymore. okay. Okay. Um, now, we we okay. may we may expand this next year, but for this 
this first year we deliberately wanted to keep it uh, fairly limited so we could test drive the concept before we expand to other like assisted or anything like that. Okay, from uh, Ed W0YK, this is always a good question. Um, if DL1AAA sends 13 in his exchange, should I log 13 or should I put the, put in the uh, correct zone of 14? Uh, will uh, Would he still get credit for the QSO? That is a Ed should, Ed should know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, should we bring him on here. Bring him on here. And let him answer. <laughs> Ed, Ed, why are you asking me this question? No, um, no, it's a very good question. The way we check the logs is this: if the other guy sends in a log and he has thirteen in his log, we expect to see thirteen in your log. But if he didn't send anything, I mean, if he doesn't send his log in, then uh, we don't. So uh, just. So if he sends it to you, uh, you you should log what he sends you if you think he's going to send in a log. <laughs> How's that for a circular answer? Yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, let's go across the pond to Wes. Uh, Sugar Papa 4 Zulu, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll let you uh, take it, Randy. Uh, is the CQ Worldwide going to make real-time scoring like Russian web page or make any rep recommendations for participants to use it? So I will say personally, I like online scoreboard sites. I think they're they're part of the future, and they make the they make the game uh, more interesting. But today, the CQ Worldwide has no um, you know we have no plans to make a scoreboard site or you know to require them or recommend one over another. Uh, we just think it's a great tool for people who want to to use it and have fun. And so we do we don't prohibit it. Um, but uh, we have to be careful because some of these online scoreboard sites are showing enough information that it starts to become very close to being um, uh, like, almost like the DX cluster assistance. So for now, it's okay if you look and see what the other guy's score is, but it's not okay if you start trying to dig in and get more information about what's going on uh, instead of just operating the radio. Okay, I've got three more here. Well, let's run through these quick, and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, Louise just wants a uh, clarification. So classic operator is multiband. Yes. Okay. Uh, Chad, KD0, Uniform Whiskey Zulu, when operating multi-operator, single transmitter, uh, under a single call, how often can operators switch out? And as much as they want. There's no limit on that. Okay. And finally, last one, uh, down to Columbia and John, Hotel Kilo 3, Charlie, uh, what about stations that operate close to the band edge? Uh, what is considered out-of-band contact and therefore invalid? Uh, well, today we have no, um, we're not, this isn't something that we're actively checking. Um, if we receive a complaint or we hear of somebody who's deliberately out of the band for some period of time, then we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. The challenge here is that not every country uh, seems to have the same regulations with regard to the band edge that we have in the United States, for example. So what may be okay in some places is not okay in others. So for now, um, again, we, we'd like people to follow the rules of their country and of the, of the ITU regulations and so on, um, uh, but only if it was really a persistent problem would we um, consider taking action. Okay, very good. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, anything else you want to hit on yet, Randy, before we close this out? No, I appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to join us uh, today, and most of all, look forward to seeing you on the radio. That's what it's all about. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Randy, for uh, taking the time to put together the presentation and for being here, and I think more than anything for you and the uh, crew that does a fantastic job, uh, which is undoubtedly the uh, most popular contest worldwide. It's a heck of a lot of work, and you guys do a fantastic job, and uh, I, I know everyone appreciates it. Uh, the other thing I would mention is I just uh, sent out a chat a little bit earlier to everyone. Um, go ahead and uh, talk up the program uh, we have here. Let people know about the uh, webinar program. Um, you can email me if you'd like to get on the uh, list for uh, uh, 
when uh, when events come up, uh, we'll uh, we'll notify you uh, when future webinars are scheduled. So uh, you can go ahead and get on that. And also, uh, this is uh, recorded and it's on the uh, WWROF webpage. I'll shoot this off to the uh, webmaster this afternoon, and hopefully we'll have it up in the next uh, 24 to uh, 48 hours. So let people know about the program. Uh, we got plenty of room. Love to have uh, people join us. So with that, uh, thanks again, Randy. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great weekend, a uh, great week, and we'll see everyone on the air here in a couple of weeks for the single sideband uh, running of the uh, CQ Worldwide Contest. Uh, 73s, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.